Good morning, church. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 17. If you're visiting Christ Church this morning, we are very grateful that you worship Jesus, and we're uh, very pleased that you would choose to worship him with us. And so we hope you feel comfortable to join in this morning, and just, we're all worshiping the same man and what he did for us, and we hope that you can just participate to your heart's desire. And uh, we'd love to get to know your story and why you're with us, and if you feel comfortable uh, sharing that with us, as Peyton said, we'd love to meet you out in the foyer afterwards, and just to get to know what your journey is and how we can help you on that journey. Uh, Do you ever get discouraged when you're like, you just don't want to study or work, and you just want to relax a little bit, and you turn on your television, which has 108 channels, and nothing's on? Am I the only person who's like, oh my goodness, and now they're showing cornhole on ESPN, this is how desperate we are. And I think... There has to be a better alternative. Well, have I got a deal for you? Are you ready? If you don't want to binge another season of Friends or watch Dumb and Dumber for the 47th time, and I kind of do, but if you don't, uh, we want to introduce you to something that our church is partnering with. It's called Right Now Media. Just imagine it's Netflix for Bible studies, seminars, and documentaries. It is a fantastic resource, and it comes to you by participating at Christ Church. You get it for free. There's no cost to it. And it has an extensive library. We've had access to it, the staff has, since about May. And I spent a lot of time looking at some Bible studies, doing some research on it. It is really, it's not cheesy stuff. It's real, there's some, but it's really good. And you can find whatever you're interested in. If you're looking for a personal Bible study or you have a, a group at work that wants to do a Bible study together, these are available. These videos can be shown on your tablets, your phones, your computers. It's a direct access You'll create an account as a participant here at Christ Church, and you can get the app on your phone right now if you so chose. It's called Right Now Media. There are hundreds of teaching and training videos for your children, uh, good things that they can watch that teach them about Scripture and about Jesus, and you can watch it with them and start great conversations. It can couples Bible studies, your own personal Bible study. I can't oversell this. I'm gonna tell you, if you give it a shot, you're gonna find some great things and some encouragements. And did I mention it was free? That's my favorite cost, how about yours? And so all you need to do is you need to, you got an invitation this morning, if we have your email address, you got an invitation this morning in your inbox. Make sure, check your your trash or your junk folder, it may have gone there, but if you pull that out and put it in your inbox, you can register for Right Now Media, it'll give all the information you need. If you did not receive an email from us today and you want one, there are some tables set up in the foyer that you can go give us your current email address and we will send you the link so that you can begin to participate in this right now. So you can update your email address, the one that you want us to use. You can do that at that back table. Just take you a few moments. Uh, You can get into our database. You can ask any questions about uh, Right Now Media. They can show you samples of what's available. We're gonna be posting classes. Our own classes are gonna be available. So if you miss a Wednesday night class and you wanna connect with that, all of these things are gonna be available to us. And I can't encourage you enough to uh, experiment a little bit this week. Go on there and, and put in your mind and heart things you should remember rather than some of the stuff the television wants you to remember. And it's just a great opportunity. We hope you'll take advantage of it. If you have any questions, see the, the team out there at the table and they'll answer any question you might have. How's your soul? Today, how's your soul? You've probably been asked since you've been in the building that you've seen someone and they ask you the question, how are you? And most of us say, well, physically I feel good or I don't. My job's going well or it's not. My family's good or it's not. And we answer the question, how are you? And most of us lie in church, don't we? How are you? Fine, great, good. Everything's fantastic. And it probably isn't. I want to ask you a deeper question. How's your soul? And how would you know? Do you have any sacred space in your world right now where you just have 20, 25 minutes that you just sit and you talk to God about the condition of your soul. Is it, is it healthy? Is it empty? Is it distracted? And how would you know? Well, today one of the things we're gonna talk about in the text in Luke chapter 17 is how you know the condition of your soul. And it's not a threatening thing. You won't feel shame today. I just wanna walk with you and say, can you take some sacred time to measure the depth of your soul and find out what your condition truly is? Let's begin in Luke chapter 17, verse 11. You'll see at the very beginning, if you have your Bibles open to it, in verse 11, you'll see that Luke writes while he was on his way to Jerusalem. This is Luke's way, and you'll see it most every time he does it. It is Luke's way of pointing out that Jesus is heading toward the crucifixion. 
This is not just n- noting where he is on a map. He's telling us something, that Jesus is going to die on the cross for the sins of the world to establish his kingdom in power and majesty and glory. He's gonna not establish a kingdom one day, he's gonna establish a kingdom this day. And all who follow him and all who receive what he's offering, his grace and his mercy, can enter into his kingdom right now. You don't have to wait till you die. You don't have to wait for another day. Please don't turn salvation into my sins are forgiven and one day I'll play a harp. Salvation is my sins are forgiven and I can start living right now in the hope and power of Jesus Christ. And I can invite other people into that as well. That's what Luke means when he says, while he was on his way to Jerusalem. But while he's on that way, he encounters a hopeless situation. Let's continue reading. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. So Jesus is journeying toward Jerusalem, knowing that this is all going to come to a head exactly like God told him it would, and he would have to offer himself for the sins of the world and save us into this new kingdom. And on the way, he comes across ten leprous men. In a book called Where is God When It Hurts, leprosy has been described as a disease that affects the nerve endings in the outer extremities of the body. The feet, the hands, the nose, the eyes all become numb. They become immune to pain. It's been noted in this book that there have been people with leprosy who had broken their ankle and had no idea they'd broken their ankle. That's how how truly numb they were to any pain sensation. And today research shows that it's the numbness in the appendages by this infection that allows for damage to to set further in fingers and toes, nose, ears, lips, have all been lost as a complication to this infection. It was contagious, so they were isolated. And not only was this a death sentence, but they would, in the entire time, they would be dying, they would be isolated from all social contact. They were not allowed to go into the villages because they were contagious. They were not allowed to have physical contact with anybody. They couldn't hug their spouse or hold their children. They they were not comforted in any way. They were ostracized. They were pushed out of the city because a disease like that could wipe out an entire village. So they had to live in the outskirts of town. And Jesus is going from one place to another, headed toward Jerusalem, and he walks by, and there are 10 men living in community. Some of them may have been rich at one point or always poor. Some of them may have been well-educated or no education at all. Some had been married, and some weren't married. Some had children, and some had none. It didn't matter. None of what separated them from the others. They had one thing in common. They had a death sentence. It was called leper. And they hear that Jesus is coming by. Oh, and by the way, they couldn't even worship. The worshiping community would not allow them in. And to be freed of this, they would have to go to the priest and be cleansed by the priest before they were allowed to even enter in. They were isolated physically, socially, and spiritually. Whether they got it by foolishness or by accident, it didn't matter. How they got it didn't matter. They had it. They were set apart and not in a good way. George MacDonald, I believe, is one of, the, one of the least known proficient Christian authors of all time. That might challenge you to look up some of his stuff. The Princess and the Goblin would be a, a children's story you might read as an adult and find out you're a kid at heart. George MacDonald was a preacher in England. He was in a small uh, church in the middle of the 19th century, and one day the deacons of the church came to him and told him that they no longer could afford his salary and he should probably move on. MacDonald loved being a pastor, and so he told them that he would remain, support himself by his writing and teaching. He went home that night and told his wife what he told the deacons, and his wife knew something he didn't, and she pulled him aside, and she told him that it was kind what he was doing, but she said, George, it isn't that people here are too poor to support us. They don't want us. And she was right. She knew something MacDonald didn't see, that the congregation wasn't just not willing to support him. They didn't want him anymore. They wanted him to leave George MacDonald said for the rest of his life, those words hurt him. And I imagine how much it hurt his wife to tell him that, we're not welcome here, we need to go. And so he became a distinguished poet and novelist, but he said the memory of those words haunted him for the rest of his life. Rejection is hard enough to take when we did something to deserve it. Could you imagine the rejection that lepers felt when they did nothing wrong? They just were a threat. And they were isolated and they were lonely and they were broken and they were going to die. You see, there was no cure for leprosy. Well, we know the rest of the story, right? There is a cure for leprosy, but they didn't know it. And on this side of of the gospel, 
we can look at this story and go, oh, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. They didn't know it was gonna be okay. And that particular day in this helpless situation, a life-altering exchange took place. Let's look at verse 12. Jesus is walking by. They have to stay at a distance, remember? In fact, I, I, I'm told in some places that it was code that if a leper came near someone who didn't have leprosy, they not only had to stay at a distance, but they had to acknowledge, don't come near me, I'm infectious. What a horrible life they had. And Jesus is walking by, and they raised their voices. The ten of these men, as different as they were, had one thing in common. They were dying. And they cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They heard, they heard of him. They call him Master. They, they know he's a healer. And they cry out against all odds. They cry out in faith. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. And wait, 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 slow down, Mark. I expect this big dramatic moment, right? These 10 lepers are on the side of the road and Jesus is walking with his disciples and he sees the leper and his heart goes out in compassion. So he runs over to them, he embraces them all and he says, this is ridiculous, I love you, you're healed. No. 10 men are on the side of the road, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And he said, go to the temple and show yourself and he keeps walking. That seems kind of odd, doesn't it? If you've been with us through this series of taking Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and looking at them chronologically, You'll understand that Jesus seldom heals the same way because it's, the, it's not a, he's not gonna give us a recipe on how he heals. He's just gonna let us know he's the one who heals. So instead of having this big emotional moment that Hollywood would love him to have, he just simply says, go to the temple because they knew that if they were cleansed, that the priest would be the one that announced them clean so that society would welcome them back in. This was a chance for them not only to escape their death penalty, but also to be reunited socially and spiritually with the people they lived with. Fathers going home to their wives and, and kids, and, and these 10 men were desperate. And then it says, and I love this, he tells them to go to the temple. Instead of them arguing with him about, come on, heal me, heal me, heal me, I don't wanna go to church. It just simply says they got up and went. Oh, church, how it would help every single one of us to quit arguing with God about what he asks us to do and just do it. Just believe that when he tells us to go, we go. And when he tells us no, it's no. If we just trusted like these 10 men with a life sentence toward death. But they get up and then the beautiful part that Luke records and Luke's kind of funny for me because he doesn't give you a lot of detail. He says, oh yeah, and as they were going, they were cleansed. 30 feet, three miles. How far did they go? Did they turn around and instantly were cleansed? Did their action of faith instantly heal them? Remember what he told the blind man in John 9? He spit, he made mud, he put it on, their eyes and he said, or on his eyes and he said, go to the pool and wash your face. And when the man went to the pool and washed his face, he got his sight back. Sometimes God asks us to do unusual things because he's God and he knows what he's doing. For many of us, we want to argue about the details. How about we just obey? Because faith is always demonstrated through obedience. And so you have this moment, they're going and they're cleansed. What a celebration. What a moment. Now, I don't want you to visually picture it because I've seen pictures of leprosy and I'd rather wish I hadn't. But just imagine, all of a sudden, a man's hand is white and the skin is dead and the meat is infected and he can't feel it, but it's gross and it smells and all of a sudden he's walking toward the priest and he looks down and he's like, you're kidding me. He's got a real hand again. I don't know if his nose fell off, if it came back, I like to think so. But they're walking down the road and they're like, dude, me too. What happens? Well, the deeper soul reaction to God's mercy. I need to repent a little bit because this text will has always been a text where I talked about gratitude. We're not grateful enough. We need to be more grateful. I want to change my tune. I think God's teaching me something different. Let's read verses 15 through 19. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed, but the nine, where are they? No one was found who returned to give glory to God except this Samaritan. And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. I don't blame the nine. In fact, I want to ask you the question. Did the one guy who turned around actually obey? Let's see if we've been paying attention. What did Jesus tell him to do? 
Go to the priest? Did he go to the priest? Uh Uh-uh. So is it okay to disobey sometimes? Hmm. I'll let you figure that. I could get fired if I answered that question. So what happens? I remember one time my dad was going to work, and I know my dad worked odd shifts for the airlines. He worked for United Airlines, and he worked odd shifts. And I remember one time it was in the afternoon. I remember a lot of times he'd go to work at like 2.30 or 3, because he'd come see some of my ball games, and he could only stay an inning or two till he had to be at work. And I remember one time he came in, and we were downstairs, and I, or we were in our family room watching the Cubs game. So it was an afternoon back when the Cubs only played in the afternoons at home. And he came in, and he said, hey, I need you guys to do this before it gets dark. And he said to me, specifically, I remember the moment, he said, Mark, cut the front lawn. Now, we had three pieces of our, of our lawn, and so we each had a rotation. He said, Mark, would you cut the front? And I said, yeah. And he said to Steve to pull some weeds, and he told Scott to go burn, take the trash out and burn it. This was back when we didn't care about the ozone. Okay, so he put it in the trash can, and we'd light it on fire, and it was awesome. Anyway, so he gave us these three jobs, and I remember distinctly my father saying to us, get it done before it gets dark, and I think he was talking about me cutting the grass. And so we're sitting there, and the game must have probably typical Cubs in the 70s, they were losing. And so My brother Steve said, all right, I got an idea. Let's go clean up the garage too. My dad's garage is a train wreck. And so we went out there and we started organizing stuff and putting stuff in. You could actually get a car in it, which was novel. And we had all these ideas and we were working hard. We had music playing and we were actually getting along. No one was fighting. It was awesome. But we didn't do the three things he asked us to do. It got dark. I remember coming home. Instead of my father throwing a parade for how industrious we were, and how we went above and beyond, my father very kindly looked at it. He said, boys, this is awesome, which was a lie because he was mad. He knew where everything was. Now he knew where nothing was. <laughs> but he looked at us and said, as nice as it was for you to clean the garage, that's not what I asked you to do. He said, so when I ask you to do something, do what I ask you to do and then do extra beyond it. I've never forgotten that lesson of being a fifth or sixth grade kid. And it was a good lesson. And he was right. We meant well, but we didn't do it. Is that what this dude did? Jesus said, go to the temple, see the priest. He doesn't go to the temple and see the priest. Did he disobey? No, because he's a Samaritan. And guess what the racist Jews would never have allowed? A Samaritan to go to the temple and see the priest. The priest wouldn't see him. But here's the best part. This has made my tail wag all week. I get to tell you this. He did go to the priest, the priest, not a priest. He did go to the temple, not a temple. Are you you listening to me? He went to the capital P priest and the capital T temple, not the minor case priest and the minor case temple. He did obey. It just looked different. Because he realized, why go to a priest who has to talk to God when I can go to God? And he returns and he falls on his face He goes to the ultimate priest. He goes to the ultimate temple. You see, he recognizes, I want you to track with me, he recognizes where the compassion of God is, God is. And where the power of God is, God is. And where the grace and mercy of God is, God is. So why have to go to somebody who represents God when you can actually go to God? Aren't we grateful that we don't have to go through priests anymore or pastors or churches to find Jesus? It's only, the, the value of the church is once you've discovered Jesus, you have a community of people that help you discover him more and more and more as we grow. And so he goes, and I love this, he's a Samaritan so he can't go to the temple. So he goes to the temple. And it says he falls on his face and worships. And the, the grammar here, that I under, if I understand it correctly, he doesn't just fall down saying thank you, thank you, thank you. He is loud. He's obnoxious. He is letting the world know how much mercy and grace he's received through his healing. You see, should we judge the other nine? Jesus asks the question, but I don't think it's a condemning question. They actually did what he told them to do. I think what he's pointing out to us is they were more worried about the temporary healing The Samaritan understood the real healing. You see, and I know, I feel like a buzzkill every time I do something like this. I get you all excited about Jesus, and then I throw reality into it, and you're all like, oh. Everyone Jesus ever healed died again. Every person he raised from the dead died again. Jesus did not come to temporarily heal us for the next 30 or 40 years. He came to bring us something that would never be taken from us. This one man figured it out. 
and he falls on his knees and he begins to worship Jesus. Maybe you've had a similar experience. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you were able to bless somebody in a way that they couldn't bless themselves? Or have you ever received a blessing from, from somebody? Somebody did something for you that you never could. I, I have a, a friend in this church who has been so kind to me and on occasions he's done things for me I never could have done for myself and I don't know how to express it except there's a joy in my heart and the words, I thank you, don't seem enough. Have you had that experience? Now, if you're a grandparent in the room, I know you have. Because when you were raising your grandparents' parents, you didn't have the money to do what you can do now. You didn't have the time or energy. But I love when grandparents can do things for their grandkids that they couldn't do for their own children, and there's a joy in that. And there's that moment where you do something for someone, and they can't believe you've just given them this gift. And it doesn't have to be monetary value. It could be something sentimental. My mom Laughed one time, I used to play dominoes with my grandparents, and that's what we did because they didn't have a television. Oh my goodness, how did they make it? And so they would play dominoes with me on the kitchen table. And I remember my mom came up and she, for Christmas, she goes, I didn't wrap it, but I thought you might want these. And she gave me the dominoes of my grandfather in the tobacco tin that he used to smoke his pipe out of. Now some of you are going to judge him, don't. He's in heaven, he's fine. <laughs> but I, I won't take those dominoes out I won't take them out of that tobacco tin. That's everything of a valuable memory. And I said to my mom, you probably haven't given me anything in this life, outside of life, that right now means more to me than this. I, my heart was full. And I just couldn't, I couldn't quit thanking her for thinking of letting me have that. Does this make sense? Do you know why this man went back? He didn't go back because his mom twisted his ear and said, say thank you. He didn't walk back because if he didn't say thank you, the leprosy would come back. Jesus isn't teaching on being on, on ingratitude. He's not teaching about our ingratitude. He's actually showing us that real gratitude comes from understanding the depth of mercy we've received and all that Jesus wants to offer us. For weeks we've been talking about how people are blinded and deaf to the sights and words of Jesus. This man was not only healed of leprosy, his eyes were opened, his ears were opened, and he went to the priest to the temple, and he worshiped. I asked you when we started, how's your soul? How is it? Is it healthy? Is it numb? Is it discouraged? Is it starving? You see, gratitude comes most often from those that are surprised at the true mercy they've received. So when I asked you how your soul is, I told you that one of the indicators of how your soul is is when was the last time you sat with Jesus, you sat at his feet, and you just bragged about him. So if my folks are here today, I'm gonna say, Mom and Dad, I remember Dad, you working two and three jobs to make sure that I could get a new baseball glove or cleats or paying our bills. And Mom, I remember how many times it would have been easier for you to do this, but you stayed home and you loved on us and you were there for us all the time. And Mom, I don't know how many times you told me what I didn't wanna hear because I needed to hear it. And now as a 53-year-old man, I can't forget your words because you were right and I was wrong. I can't, I, I can't say thank you enough for you giving me those dominoes and, and blessing our family when we were a young couple trying to figure things out. Mom and Dad, I can't thank you enough for the way that you helped me go to college when you didn't have the money, and I didn't realize you didn't have the money, but you paid for my room and board. I don't know how you did it. You see, if I stop for a second and get over me, my heart is full of gratitude, and I'll tell you, I'm not a good person. Don't amen. <laughs> those of you who know me, just go with me, okay? Those of you who don't, pretend but it's not easy for me to be a grateful person because I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. And I want people to recognize what I've done instead of stopping and just experiencing the joy of realizing how blessed I am. This is not a message that says you ought to be more grateful. This is a, question, this is a message that asks the question, have you thought about how grateful you can be? Have you stopped and just thanked God for all he's done? And if you never asked him for another thing, that'd be a great prayer. Appreciate what he's given you and acknowledge who gave it to you. You see, this is what faith means here. It's not just believing that Jesus has been good, it's understanding how good he is and expecting that for the rest of your days. Colossians chapter three, verse 17 says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. How's your soul? 
Is it full of gratitude? Is it easy to express it? Have you been able to pause and create sacred space in your life? This is not a shame thing. I'm encouraging you. Turn the television off. Turn the phone off. It, it, they, they have an off switch for a reason. Turn off the ball game. Turn off your iPad. Turn off your computer. Turn off the noise in your house and just sit and give yourself 20 minutes of sacred space, 30 minutes, and just sit there and have a conversation with God recognizing who he is because he loves your love and he's earned it. And most of us, we don't think that we struggle with gratitude and we probably don't except we don't give ourselves any time to express it. So when you came in this morning, there was a card on your chair and one of the finest pens ever created in the world. <laughs> and I know you know that because they are all over town. Get an oil change, Christchurch pen. Go to a restaurant, Christ church pen. I don't know this for a fact. Someone told me he found one at a bar. I forgave him. It was funny. <laughs> People hand me a pen to pay for mine. I said, do you, go to, do you go out to Christ church? And they're like, no. And I'm, fantastic. How'd you get my pen? <laughs> these cards and these pens, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to create some sacred space in the room today as a sample of what could be every day if we got our attention focused correctly. I want you to take that card and I would like you to think about this. I'd like you to think of three to five things from your lifetime that you would like to just tell God thank you for. Healing, relationship, provision. Maybe it's the time God told you no. Maybe it's the time he didn't answer a prayer. But I'd like you to sit in a sacred moment and just sit here and then I'd like you to keep this card and I'd like you to add to it all week. This is no homework assignment. You're not going to turn it in. Just want you to taste how beautiful it is to sit down and say to God, that one time you did this and that one time you did that and every day that you do this, I'm, my heart is full. Fall on your knees in worship. In verse 19, I just want to allude to it briefly. In verse 19, Jesus says to the man on his face, remember, he stood from a distance and he cried out and then he fell down his face and he cried out and Jesus said to him, get up. Your faith has made you well. I'm told in the original language, the expression he uses for get up would have been resurrection terms. He would say, some of your translations say it more aptly, rise. Because in our gratitude, it helps us to rise. It helps us to stand up and walk by faith. When the world says that there is no God and God's not real and your prayers are all psychological games, you remember how good your God's been. And you keep testifying to how good your God's been. And if you don't know how good God is, let me introduce you to Jesus. And you'll understand quickly how much gratitude he deserves and how much abides within you. Spend a few moments. Write down the things that you need to say thank you for.